Hey guys, this is Kenjido, and welcome to another MakeShot Pro video. So I've been wondering, have you ever had the burning desire to draw one of the Pokemon characters Jigglypuff? Well, neither have I, but the simplicity and the shape of this character makes for a great vector graphics tutorial project. So that's what we're going to do in this video. Disclaimer, I'm not making this from memory, but I have a reference image. Uh, we'll be using only PaintShop Pro, primarily drawing with uh, vector graphics shapes and doing a little bit of hand painting for the shadows. Um, and the video will mostly be a time lapse, but I'll slow it down when introducing specific techniques. So let's get to it. Okay, so to start out with, I created the background with the art and media layer brushes, uh, primarily the watercolor one. And this was actually really just a whole lot of experimenting. Uh, I'm not really a pro with the art media stuff, but I figured I'd give it a try just to give more of a textured painterly look to the background. You can see I'm trying to blend the middle. It didn't quite work out the way I was expecting it to, so I ended up painting with white and then just blend it, blending afterward. The background could have been done in vector graphics. Um, it probably would have taken a little bit longer. I would have had to have find, found another reference image. Um, but this seems sufficient. Just a little bit of grass, a little bit of blue sky for the background for our Jigglypuff. So now we're going to start drawing the vector graphics and essentially this can be done by clicking on the um, preset shapes vector graphic button on the left and you can see all I'm doing is working with ovals and the the basic body shape I made a perfect circle because the Jigglypuff's body is perfectly circle and the easiest way to do that is when you're dragging the shape into view if you hold down shift it'll force the object to have square dimensions. So that's that's how you can create a perfect square. And right now I'm just adding a bunch of ovals for all the different parts and you'll notice that I'm very specific about what layers I'm putting them on and this allows me to hide or bring to the front or basically control whether something's in front or behind in the Jigglypuff. And you'll see that Beyond just general arrangement it'll be really helpful when we have to get into painting and doing other things but Right now, really all I'm doing is just getting a general sense of where all the major pieces fit and adjusting accordingly. We'll get to the shaping of the specific parts to be more accurate in a little bit. All right, so quick detour. I just wanna make sure that we have a good coverage of terminology here. So, so essentially the tool that I'm using to draw vector graphics, in this case, ellipses is this button here and it already happens to be the shape that I want which is an ellipse. My colors are already set to have a line and a solid fill and I have my width set to three. So I'm gonna hold shift draw and I've got my perfect circle there. I can use this pick tool and even force it to be in the middle. Now so this is my vector object and these different points here are what I'm referring to as nodes. Now the manipulation of those nodes is done using the pen tool. So even though I created the vector object here, to manipulate it, I need to be in the mode where the pen tool is selected. Now, I've done that, but I still can't manipulate the nodes independently. This is still treated as a whole shape. So if I right click and say convert to path, now I have this node here. And you can see when I click on the node, I have these handles is what I call these. Now I can move the node itself or I can grab this handle and you can see by grabbing the handle and twisting it changes the shape. Now pulling it and shortening it you can see also has an effect, right? And so it'll take some playing with to really get used to how all these manipulations work and what they do. Um, it's just a matter of practice. And the last point I'll make is that you can change the node type and one you'll see me do often is changing one to cusp. And what that does now is it allows me to bend one side independent of the other and this is most commonly used to try to create these nice sharp corners. So now that I've manipulated this shape, when I go back to this mode, I can still treat it as a whole object, move it around, rotate it, do whatever. All right, so let's get back to the tutorial.
So now we've entered the stage where we're starting to form the shapes. And the most important part is when you select one of your vector graphics that you right click on an edge and choose convert to path. Because what this does now is it allows you to start manipulating each node individually. And you can see clicking on each of the nodes, which are the tiny squares along the path, handles appear. And those handles allow you to change the angle and the shape. Um, and you'll see just as I kind of move around that this is how we can form things like the feet, the hands, the ears, and the hair. Now in this particular case, I'm adjusting the rotation because I want one of the nodes in a specific place. And in this case, we'll slow it down a bit because what I'm doing is changing the node type. And what this does is it allows me now to move each one of the handles independently and therefore create a sharp corner. Normally, without changing the node type to cusp, which is what I did, uh, the, the standard node type, which is symmetric, will always just bend both sides of those handles together and create just a different angle, kind of like you see at the bottoms of the ears. So there's different node types that are needed to make different adjustments uh, depending on the shape you want to make. And you can also make sharp points by just bending two different nodes and not even changing the type. Uh, it just doesn't give you as sharp of a point. It gives more of a sharp rounded corner. But in this case, I was trying to have sharp points for the hands and the ears. So like in this case here for the other hand, I'm actually just shrinking the handles together rather than changing the node type and you get a very similar effect. So now I'm gonna move one of the hands back because I realize in the final image it makes more sense for that hand to be behind the body rather than in front. And you'll see when we start trimming down some of the edges why this makes sense. So now what we're doing is using what's called the knife tool. And what this does is it allows you to make cuts into your line, the edge of your shape, and then be able to delete one side. So essentially what I've done is I've made two cuts and now I've deleted the back side. And now you have what looks more like an arm that is attached to his body rather than just an oval floating over it. So then now we're going to do the same thing for the hair tuft, if you will, on his forehead. And now I can independently work with those two edges now as if it were a completely open uh, line. Yep. Adjusting the nodes, adjusting the handles on the nodes, just to get the exact shape that I really want to create for the hair. So in that case, we cut a sphere up and then reshaped it. But then next, what we want to do to create a little bit more of a sort of a line that indicates the hair pattern, uh, we're going to draw a new line with the pen tool and use a bezier curve. And in this case, I'm using two steps because I, I want it to kind of do an S shape and, and you can only do one bend per line segment. So I'm using two line segments to create it. Now, I wanted that line to kind of curve and point at the other line near the back of his head. So I redid that line so that that point kind of matches a little bit better. So now we've got that nice little bangs tuft on the jiggly buff. And at this stage, you can start to see a little bit more of the, the refined shape, if you will. Uh, once again, cutting the body now. Um, but one important thing that if you make two cuts and there's no node in between those two, then you won't be able to delete it because you have to be able to select the line that you want to delete. So what I did there was made two cuts added a point by holding control and clicking on the line and that adds a new point and then you can delete it. So now I'm using once again the Bezier line tool and this is just to create sort of the inner ear path. doing it for both ears. You can see there's a lot of manipulation with just the nodes and adjusting the handles. So at this stage, I'm filling in the eyes, but really all this is is just 
adding more shapes and again holding shift to ensure that the ellipses become true circles um, and just creating more patterns that are the filling in of the different reflections and color light parts of the eyes. Using some cusp nodes there to get the sharp corners. Now I've created one eye and I realize just with the lighting it's it, it's perfectly fine in this case to make a copy of that eye and move it over. In some cases that doesn't always work but in this one it did so instead of redoing both eyes I just made a copy and moved it over. Now you may have noticed at this stage of the video suddenly there's all these sh nice shadows under all the different parts and I apologize. Uh, I didn't quite hit record when I was working on that part so that's why there's no video of it. but. I do want to explain how the shadowing is done, and I also realized at this point that I didn't put the shadows in for the ears, so right after doing the base shadow under his feet, we'll get to exactly how these other pink shadows were applied. So here we go. To do the, the shadow coloring, essentially what needs to be done is with the object picker, you have to make sure you have the right object selected. In this case, it's the inner ear and you use the selection tool magic wand and you click on the color region. So in this case, it's the gray. And then what happens is you create a new raster layer above that. And with that selection in place, now when I paint, it's restricted to the region identified by the selection. So I can't paint outside of that region and I can just keep my brushwork focused on the direction that I'm painting in and not stopping within the lines. So to repeat that for the second ear, go to the vector layer, use the magic wand to select the gray, then go back to the raster layer, bring up the brush tool once again, and then now I can just freely brush and not have to worry about going outside of the lines. This is equivalent to, like in Sketchbook, what they call locking transparency, essentially just restricting where you're painting to make life a little bit easier. So reducing the opacity a little bit on that layer just to make it not so intense. And there you have it. There is our finished Jigglypuff. I think in total it took me about a half an hour. Um, but I'm pretty happy with how it came, how it all came together. So we covered a whole lot in a very short period of time. Um, a whole lot of different elements of vector graphics. The main topics we covered were basically creating the preset shapes, forming them with the nodes and handles, drawing lines and then ultimately being able to paint using selections off of the vector graphics. So as you can see, vector graphics are pretty powerful. Uh, I had some fun with this tutorial and drawing this little guy. I hope you were able to learn some stuff. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, go ahead and post a comment, and if you like updates, go ahead and describe. That's it for this one. I'll see you guys next time.